and we are good to go. So, we are in chapter six, and I am gutting most of this chapter. Um, this chapter is kind of geometric stuff in three-dimensional space. It's it has very little application to anything that I have ever found. Good morning. So it's not really the kind of thing I want to focus on. I'm, I've selected section 6.1 as kind of a rep representative sample of what all of the sections in this chapter look like. And we'll do it, and then maybe Thursday we'll do um, 6.5 or something. But but chapter 6 or most of chapter 6 is concerned with is surfaces, or you could say solids, of revolution. So, say that you have, let's start with the x-axis. Say that you have axis and say that you have some positive curve. Um, and we're going to think of this x-axis and this positive curve as physical objects. Like that curve is physically lying there. It's a bent piece of wire, maybe, and I could pick it up and mess around with it. So let's take this bent piece of wire and we're going to fasten it to the x axis. So we can no longer move it around. But then we're going to put a hinge here and a hinge here. So that hinge is going to allow us to take this curve, this piece of wire, and rotate it in three-dimensional space. And if we rotate it 360 degrees in three-dimensional space, so that the wire ends up back where it started, we'll get, this is not perfectly to scale, but we'll get a three-dimensional object that looks kind of like a face, kind of like that. And this is a surface, this vase is a surface of revolution. And you'll notice on the whiteboard I have surfaces slash solids of revolution. Um, if we just rotate the curve, it traces out the, a hollow vase. If we fill in this region, so now instead of just a wire, we have a sheet of metal, and we rotate that sheet of metal 360 degrees. Then instead of a hollow vase, we have a solid object. 
And whether it's a hollow vase or a solid object, the goal of section 6.1 and section 6.2, but we're only going to do 6.1, the goal of section 6.1 is to find the volume of this object. Um, this is, in a sense, a very abstract kind of problem. Um, I guess pedagogically, the point of this is to give an application of the integral that doesn't require any kind of prior background on the part of the student. Like, I used integrals in my dissertation, looking at the cell division cycle of yeast. That's an application I can't really present unless I want to spend a lecture telling you about how yeast divides. So this might not be very applied, but it does have kind of the virtue that it doesn't require any background ground on the part of the student. So I do think there is value to this chapter. I just think textbooks tend to go a little overboard with this material. So let's keep this situation the same until I explicitly say we're changing it. So we'll have the x-axis and we'll have a curve above the x-axis and we are imagining this curve as a physical object. that is attached to the x-axis by hinges, and we are taking this physical object and rotating it 360 degrees to create a shape. And we want to know the volume of that shape. So integrals um, show up. When you're trying to approximate something um, by cutting it up and looking at those smaller slices. We've already seen area, right? If we want the area under the curve, we cut the curve up and we approximate it with a rectangle. We find the area of those rectangles, we get a sum. We take the limit of the sum, we get an integral. So we're going to do something very similar for volume. It's probably easiest to see if we think of this not as just the curve, but as the sheet of metal. So we want to take this part of the metal sheet and we want to rotate it around the x-axis and we want to find the volume we get just from that part of the sheet. If we can do that, then we can repeat the process. We can do something very similar to what we did with area. And we can look at each of these regions in turn. And for each of these regions, 
we take just this piece of the sheet of metal and we rotate just it around the x-axis and we repeat that process, we do it a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times, and we found the volume we're looking for. Well, the issue here, I mean, is that if we take, say, this piece of the, of the picture, I'm uh, sorry, I'm trying not to refer to color for, like, accessibility reasons, and I'm still struggling with it. If we take this part of the sheet here, and we rotate it around the curve we get around the x-axis, we get something that looks like this. And now we don't know how to find the volume of that, so great, we're back to wanting a volume and not knowing how to find it. We haven't, uh, we haven't improved our situation. But what if, I mean, I've sort of already given the answer away with these rectangles. What if instead of just taking the curve and rotating it around the x-axis, I took this rectangle and rotated it around the x-axis. If you take a rectangle and rotate it around the x-axis, the figure you are going to wind up with is a cylinder. And we do, or if we don't, we can look it up in a ge geometry textbook, but we, there is a formula for the volume of the cylinder. So that's the idea. Instead of taking the curve and rotating it around the axis, we're going to take these rectangles, and we're going to rotate them around the axis. And we'll find the volume of each of the objects we get. We'll find, I counted and now I forget, we'll find one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight volumes and we'll add those volumes up, and we'll then have an approximation of the volume that we're looking for. It will only be an approximation because we're going to get a little volume up here that we don't want, and we're going to get a little volume down there that we don't want. So we're only going to, at this point, be approximating that volume. But then we'll take a limit, and our approximation will turn into a perfect integral. So that's sort of the general, well, not even general, that's the process that we're going to follow here. Um, I appear, nope, I didn't leave it. Here's my textbook or my notebook. So let's get a formula on the board. I was a little a little hasty grabbing my notebook because we're not quite ready to do an example yet. So if we take a rectangle 
pour eux. We're creating this rectangle in the same way that we did when we were looking at area. We pick a point in a region and we draw our line up until we hit the curve. And that gives this rectangle a height. If this is f of x, that gives this rectangle a height of f of x sub i star. And just like we did when we were looking at area, we'll call the width of the rectangle delta x sub i. And we rotate this rectangle around the x-axis. and we get a cylinder. And the volume of a cylinder depends on the radius of the cylinder, and it depends on the height of the cylinder. And both of these things we can read off the graph. The height of the cylinder is going to be this width, delta x sub i. For the radius, well, we're taking this, we're rotating it around the x-axis. This f of x sub i star, this height of the rectangle, is going to be the radius of the cylinder that we create. And the volume of a cylinder with a height of delta x sub i star and a radius of f of x sub i star is pi times the radius squared times the height of the cylinder. There is the, um, the volume of a right cylinder. You might or might not have been asked to memorize that at some point, maybe in high school. So now we repeat this process. We cut this entire region into rectangles. Tangles. And we repeat this process with each of these rectangles. And every time we do this, we're going to get an expression that looks just like this. So when we take all our approximations, and we add them up, we're going to get a sum that looks like that. Is, is everyone with me so far? I genuinely do. I got a course evaluation saying that a student didn't feel like they could raise their hand in my class. I don't know if I'm projecting that somehow, but these aren't, I mean, this isn't a rhetorical question. I can always go back over something if anyone's confused by material. It's what I'm, sort of what I'm here for. If not, 
I guess I'll take you at, at your word and proceed. We, um, we have this sum of these expressions, and we want to make this approximation better. And we've already seen basically how to do this when we were looking at area. If we want better approximations, let's say that all of these intervals have equal lengths. If we want better approximations, we want to have more rectangles. And our approximation goes from being good to being exact, to just no longer being an approximation, but being the exact volume. In the limiting case, as n goes to infinity. And the limit of a Riemann sum is an integral. So, let me write the volume formula on this same frame. Getting sloppy we're on an interval from A to B, and the volume is the integral from A to B of pi times f of x squared dx. When you take the limit of a Riemann sum, um, the x sub i star turns into x, and these triangle x sub i's, these delta x sub i's, turn into the dx of the integral. And it's fairly common. I mean, it sort of varies from textbook to textbook, to video to video. But pi is just a constant, and you can pull constants out of integrals. So you'll often see this. I think I do this, in fact, in my own notes. Written with that pi sitting outside that integral. Now, in the specific um, situation we've been looking at, we've got this curve, it's strictly above the x-axis, and we're rotating it around the x-axis. Um, having the x-axis isn't really essential to any of this. We, can, uh, we could rotate around any horizontal line that we wanted to. Um, just for convenience, we won't look at horizontal lines that actually cut the region we're looking at. So we won't look at horizontal lines like that. But if we wanted to rotate around a horizontal line other than the x-axis, we can do that. Um, but before we sort of extend this, we'd probably better do an example just with this formula. Let's look at f of x equals x squared minus x plus 1 on the interval from 0 to 1. And I got so sick of writing this out when I was making the quizzes, but the problem is something like 
the region trapped. Come on, Zoom, work with me. There we go. The region trapped between f of x, the x axis, and the lines x equals 0 and x equals 1 is rotated around the x axis. Find the volume of this solid of revolution. These problems are always a mouthful. Let's do a few things. I mean, so far, we've looked at the case where our curve is above the x-axis. So let's make sure that this is sort of in that situation. It's maybe not obvious. x squared minus x plus 1. So the curve is above the x-axis. And the way this problem is written, and I mean the way the problems are written in the quizzes, might tend to make this look like it's more complicated than it is because we're saying we're between f of x and we're between the x-axis and we're between these vertical lines. So we're giving kind of each boundary of this region piece by piece, but I mean, the x-axis is just y equals 0, and x equals 1, and x equals 0. It was 1, right? Right. So, if we look at these curves, and we look at the region they're trapping, it's just zero is less than y is less than x squared minus x plus one. Also, hey, desmosis, oh, I put an o instead of a zero. And where, let me finish this up. So we're taking this region and we are rotating it around the x-axis. And this curve is above the x-axis. This is exactly the situation we described on that frame. So this is plug and play with the formula. I mean, we'll have pi times this function squared inside of an integral. The 
Well, I usually put the pi outside of the integral, but also I often forget the pi. So if you put your pi outside of the integral, make sure that it doesn't vanish during the integration process. We're integrating from zero to one. That's We've got this region and zero and one are the endpoints of the region. And then we've got our function squared. And the real problem, I mean, as far as finding a volume goes, is usually in computing the integral. Um, because computing these integrals can be very tricky. Like, if we had a sine inside of that, we don't know how to integrate sine squared. So we're pretty limited at this point in terms of the volumes we can actually find. This integral we can take, it's, it's not going to be lovely. Um, there's no real nice trick here. Like, we have a composition, but, the but um, u substitution doesn't work. If we tried letting u be the inside function, well, when we got to du, we'd need a 2x minus 1 dx, and we don't have a 2x minus 1. So there's nothing really nice here. There are no great tricks. We know how, however, we can find antiderivatives of polynomials as long as the polynomial is in standard form. So we're just going to have to do some simplification and hopefully, hopefully not uh, make any errors here that will come back to bite us. We've got x squared minus x plus 1 times x squared minus x plus 1. So, x squared times x squared gives us x to the fourth. x squared and negative x give us negative x cubed. x squared and 1 give us all good so far. Does anybody have any questions? Then we basically repeat this six more times. Negative x times x squared is negative x cubed. Negative x times negative x is positive x squared. Negative x times positive 1 is negative x. And I think to keep this from being super cramped, I will erase those lines, and now we'll go up. One, one times x squared is x squared. 
1 times negative x is negative x. 1 times 1 is 1. So we get this uh, unlovely looking integral. But but each of those, I mean, first of all, it simplifies. And second of all, we can integrate each of these pieces. I mean, this is, this is too long. I mean, it's not nice to look at. But from a calculus point of view, this is not a complicated integral. And let's see what simplification occurs. That x to the fourth is the only x to the fourth we have. Uh, yell out if I do something that looks wrong. Negative x cubed and another negative x cubed gives us negative 2x cubed. Then an x squared, and an x squared, and a third x squared give us 3x squared. A negative x and another negative x give us a negative 2x. And uh, one is the only constant we have. And now I suppose we can stay on this frame where it seems weird to say that we're basically done just when we start doing the calculus, but uh, expanding that function out was the most time-consuming part of this. <clears throat> One-fifth x to the fifth minus two-fourths x to the fourth plus three-thirds x cubed minus two-halves x squared plus x evaluated from zero to one. And that last one's supposed to be an x, not a one, right? You're right. Thus, x evaluated from 0 to 1. And I guess a little, we can do a little simplification if we want. 3 over 3 goes away. And 2 over 2 goes away. Now let me let me copy this again into my notes just so I'm not flipping back and forth between this and my calculator twenty times. So that's, uh, I'm normally, I'm going to find this, and I'm not forgetting about the x, so, I mean about the pi, I'll throw the pi in at the end. And this isn't actually as bad as it could be. Uh, my, my choice of limits turns this quite nice, actually. So one-fifth is 0.2, and, well, 
1 to the 5th is just 1. Uh, minus 1 half is 0.5. And again, I don't really need to put this into my calculator. I'm just doing this pedagogically. I mean, I can say in my head 1 to the 4th is 1 plus 1 to the 3rd. That's 1 minus 1 squared. That's 1 plus 1. And here I even I can't uh, bring it into my bring it myself to type this out. Zero to the fifth is zero. Zero to the fourth is zero. Zero cubed. Zero squared. Zero. We add zero to itself a bunch of times. We just get to zero from that. 0.7 pi. I promised that I wouldn't, wouldn't forget the pi. Let me write this down. So this is 0 0.7. We've got that pi. I I mean, sort of out of necessity, because it would be really hard for you to put answers like 0.7 pi into Canvas quizzes. I always just get decimal approximations for these, and I don't feel bad about that. I mean, calculus is an applied field. Uh, in applications, 99 times out of 100, an answer that looks like this is going to be more helpful to the reader than an answer that looks like 0.7 pi. So, 2.199. Oof, and that, uh, that should be the answer to that problem. These things always, uh, always take longer and to do than I think they will. In this case, it was just because that algebra was so, uh, so irritating and going from here to here. What do I want to do with six minutes? Let me, probably not time to have you do a problem. Let's just talk. We'll, we'll talk more about this tomorrow, but let's just introduce the idea. What if we don't have the x-axis? as our horizontal line that we're rotating it around. What if we have our function f of x, but we have, you know, this might be y equals negative 1, or y equals 3, or whatever. Then I Ah, here it went. Um, then the formula is going to change in the following way. Well, that the distance between the curve and the axis be called the radius. And that's because when we do
I guess I erased the cylinder. But when we take these rectangles and we rotate them around the axis, that becomes the radius of the cylinder. And the formula is the same, except that instead of f of x squared, we have this radius squared. So I'm not going to actually do this problem, but in the time remaining, let's ask ourselves what would happen if instead of the x-axis, I wanted to rotate around a different horizontal line. What would happen to this problem if I wanted to rotate around y equals negative y? rid of all of this. So let me put, here's the Cartesian plane. Forget exactly what the function looked like on this interval, but it was some kind of quadratic. And here is the line we're rotating around. Here's the line y equals negative 1. So the radius is the distance from the curve to the line. This distance here is the f of x that we had in the problem. This distance here is x squared minus x plus 1. This distance here is 1. Here's y equals 0. Here's y equals negative 1. That vertical distance is 1 unit. So the radius would no longer just be f of x. The radius would be gotten by taking these pieces and putting them together. 1 plus f of x, which is x squared minus x plus 2. So if you, um, if you have a horizontal line other than just the x-axis, it's going to appear in the problem via, via this. Instead of the function, we'll have this radius. And we'll talk more about this. Uh, this. This section might end up taking all week. It's not a terrible, I mean, obviously a short week. It's not a big deal if it does. We'll still be on schedule, but we'll finish this up. We're trying to finish this up in class tomorrow. And I will see you then. I didn't say it at the beginning of class, but I hope you had a relaxing long weekend.